Hi there, I'm Nick Workwist, Director of New Ventures at SUNY Research Foundation, the research arm for the State University of New York, or SUNY, one of the largest comprehensive public university systems in the country. SUNY Research Foundation administers over half, a billion and a half dollars in research expenditures annually across SUNY's 64 campuses. And we are laser focused on getting more SUNY technology into the market to transform people's lives. SUNY is also all in on entrepreneurship and a longtime leader in microelectronics, R&D and commercialization through our decades of experience and billions of dollars investing in building Albany Nanotech. As part of our efforts to align around upcoming federal funding through the CHIPS Act and other bills, we have been collaborating with MIT, RPI, and other stakeholders with shared interests to identify major gaps in the market in how industry, government, and academia can better partner to support microelectronics and hard tech researchers and startups. We all know significant government investment is critical for microelectronics and other hard tech innovations in terms of de-risking technologies, validating markets, and building teams. It is also a bellwether or indicator of private follow-on funding. And there's a direct correlation when more public investment is strategically invested in R&D and commercialization of new technologies, like it was in 2008 with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, the private funding from institutional and corporate investors will follow. This venture capital and corporate investment is critical for startups, not only in providing them with the runway they need to commercialize technologies and build their businesses, but in the validation and access to markets, customers, and supply chain partners that typically result from this type of support. Many say venture capital is broken when it comes to hard tech, but the billions of dollars in investment and the validation it signals to the market is critical for hard tech startups working in the space. So we need to work together to figure out how to unlock these dollars and industry cannot do it alone. Some venture funds and corporate investors do see the long-term value and resulting potential competitive advantage from going in early on these high risk technologies, which typically take lots of time and capital to get to market, as many of the folks have already mentioned here today. Today, we will hear from some of the top industry players and venture funds that are already deploying hundreds of millions of dollars in this space. But first, let's go over some quick housekeeping items. For the participants, please ask any question for our speakers through the Q&A function in Zoom, and we'll get to your answers. In this session, we will feature two 10-minute lightning talks and a 20-minute keynote. Then we'll have a 25-minute panel discussion. Now to introduce our first set of awesome speakers in this session, including Eileen Tunghall, Managing Director of InQtel, which connects cutting-edge technology, strategic investments, and purpose to advance national security for the U.S. and its allies. Eileen will provide our final lightning talk. Om Nalamasu, Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of Applied Materials, the leader in materials engineered solutions used to produce virtually every new chip and advanced display in the world, will be, will be providing a keynote talk. And kicking off the session will be a lightning talk from Sean Doyle, Managing Director of Intel Capital. Sean focuses on investments related to silicone device, technology design, development, and manufacturing, as well as on Intel. global supply chain enablement. Representative private investments include IMS Nanofabrication, Impria Corporation, and Voltaics, and public investments such as ASML Holdings, ASM International, Micron Technology, and Nikon Corporation. Sean currently serves as a director or observer on the boards of Colibre, Impria, and Reno Subsystems. Now over to you, Sean. Of course, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to be here today. I appreciate the invitation. Um, as Nick said, I've been with Intel uh, over 20 years, and um, most of that time has been uh, spent investing uh, in hard tech um, technologies in manufacturing. So first, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about Intel Capital. So Intel Capital is an operating group within Intel. Uh, we invest off of the balance sheet so we don't have uh, limited partners. Um, we invest directly for the corporation. And typically we put to work between 300 million and $500 million um, per year. 
Our primary fo focus is backing early stage technology companies, but um, we also invest uh, across the entire spectrum um, of uh, company stages, including late stage companies. We have a team of investors globally. Um, we put a very high priority on adding value uh, to the companies in which we invest uh, as well. Um, in general, Intel has a broad investment mandate in uh, businesses that are strategically relevant to um, Intel's core business. And those uh, companies are in the cloud space, the silicon space in which I work, new devices and frontier or disruptive uh, technologies. We do look for uh, opportunities that are strategically relevant to Intel. They're also, also financially viable and uh, have a, a an attractive return of capital potential. So let me start by saying, when I look at uh, an opportunity, how do I define what, what hard tech is? Kind of very simply put, my definition is, um, hard tech involves a very hard problem to solve. It's all, often you know, physical science or very high volume manufacturing. Um, it's typically something that's very hard to demonstrate and get a first proof of concept. It's also very hard to perfect. So once you demonstrate the capability, capability, um, can you repeat that capability time after time in a manner that's uh, able to be commercialized? It's oftentimes hard to manufacture, right? Either cost, scale, et cetera, but very challenging. It also can be hard to accelerate, which um, you know is a very sensitive issue for venture capitalists, right? How do you um, accelerate the time to money, okay? And then oftentimes it's hard to scale. Um, can you uh, take a product or technology and take it into very, very high volume, right? When we think about realization of uh, hard tech uh, opportunities, companies, first thing is, is the problem big enough, right? So as a venture investor, we're looking for opportunities um, that quote unquote, move the needle uh, for us, right? It's gotta be a big enough problem um, to merit investment. Second thing is if you create a demonstration, do you have customer validation and pull, right? Do the customers see the technology as being something that is new and differentiated enough to merit um, the effort and resources it takes to adopt it? Can it be commercialized, right? So can you source uh, the materials? Uh, can you uh, make it repeatably, right? Um, once you've made the product, uh, can you do it in a repeatable fashion with high quality? Can it be debugged? Is it reliable? And then is it cost effective, right? Is there an advantage to, uh, over what we're using uh, today? Is it hard to accelerate, right? Sometimes um, dealing with um, very hard um, scientific problems, right? So the capital might not be the issue. Um, there might be other challenges in trying to um, um, pull in an opportunity and accelerate the time to money, so to speak. And then when it's hard to scale, we look at it from capital, right? Do you have access to late stage capital, larger amounts of money, uh, banking, finance? Um, what does it take to set up a distribution channel? Is it a global distribution channel? So a number of things, uh, the problems get bigger and you need to be able to address them to uh, merit venture investment, okay? Um, so what, um, what are some of the things that uh, we look for um, when we're considering investments um, in the hard tech space um, for companies and entrepreneurs to think about? The first thing I would say is that we invest in companies and not projects, right? Sometimes we're approached and um, with companies that have a new technology, and I would almost say they are new product features rather than new products. So we really need a new product concept um, to merit interest in us, um, you know, in making an equity investment. The second thing that we look for that I think is very critical is, is there a proof of concept, right? Is there existing technical data that validates the concept and demonstrates that um, you can actually um, um, produce uh, the product, right? Simulations are helpful, but at the end of the day, um, simulations, um, you know, still represent a fair amount of risk versus actually having a proof of concept demonstrated. And this obviously is a place uh, that I'm sure has been discussed today. How do we help companies get uh, beyond a proof of concept to hard data that then uh, can generate interest and reduce risk to, so venture investors um, um, will engage and commit? 
The other thing that's important for us when we're looking at um, hard tech companies is really, can you identify and attract both stage and domain appropriate uh, investors, right? So um, it really is challenging to do the due diligence for hard tech companies. Um, there's a certain level of understanding that oftentimes is required domain expertise and really the investors that tend to add the most value and uh, can execute deals, um, you know, have that expertise. The other thing which seems a little more administrative, but frankly is quite important um, is um, making investments with companies that you have and or use industry standard transaction processes, documents and services, right? So when we um, look at hard tech oriented companies, um, there are a lot of challenges in taking those companies forward and growing them. Um, the, the last thing that we want to deal with when we initially engage is having to do, um, you know, clean up or restructure a company. So I think it's important to have an ecosystem and have the right talent engaged to have a company that is ready to accept, uh, you know, institutional capital. Okay. When we move beyond the investment or the transaction piece, um, you know, as an investor, what are we looking for in our in the companies, in our co-investors, and as well as ourselves, right? So things that help in the hard tech space are obviously shared development resources, both for cost um, and efficiency, right? It's obviously expensive to um, um, develop and debug um, uh, hardware-oriented investments. Um, so to the extent that there are more shared development resources, labs, metrology, um, demo stands, et cetera, um, that is a big plus um, for incentivizing us to invest as well as for growing the company. It's also networks to source talent and services. You know, we're all often looking for an indication that the company uh, already has excellent talent, obviously, but has um, sources to attract uh, sources of talent to bring in um, uh, new people to grow the company and also de-risk the company from a succession plan. We're looking for access to an engagement of customers. I think obviously uh, if you consider the hard tech space, um, there are a lot of strategic investors, corporate investors that are now putting money into the space and getting engaged and they're staying engaged, right? They're not coming in and out of the market. And, um, we're looking for uh, those types of uh, customer engagements um, to help fund companies as well as build a, start to build a customer base around a company so that you're growing the customer base as you grow the company. The other thing we look at is the supply chain characteristics when we're making an investment. So if the company does actually start to scale, um, is the su supply chain sustainable? Is it um, from a risk perspective, is it you know parity or better to what we have today for us as a company to bring that technology uh, into our company and continue continue to invest capital? We're also looking for follow follow on investment, so um, a, a, an ability to de-risk a company by having strong co investors uh, along with us is important, um, and co investors who can add value to the company beyond just money. Okay. The last thing that I'll comment upon is liquidity. Uh, I think this uh, aspect of venture investing sometimes um, isn't considered as much when we're figuring out how to raise capital and get companies started. But it's very important to keep uh, founders engaged. Uh, think about employer retention uh, with regards to equity, equity dilution as you move forward. Non-dilutive capital in some form or, or in matching form always helps with that. The other thing is liquidity opportunities to access uh, later stage capital when you want to grow a company. If that's available, it certainly helps a company grow. And then the last thing is really exit considerations or limitations. What are the opportunities to um, exit a company or get the capital back out um, over time? Okay. So I'd leave you with um, one last thought. And you know, my thought uh, perspective is really, um, as we have these dialogues on how to support hard te tech companies, we really need to consider the life cycle, uh, the entire life cycle of a startup and its investors to address challenges, not just a specific aspect of it. Okay, Nick, thank you very much. Great, thanks, Sean. Lots, Lots of impact there in the panel discussion. And, and Sean will be joining us um, for the panel discussion.
Um, next, I, it's, our, it's our pleasure to introduce Dr. Om Nalamasu, who's Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for Applied Materials. He brings extensive experience and passion to the role of CTO, where he's leading the development of new product pipelines, securing government funding for key strategic projects, and building a world-class team to maintain applied materials technology leadership in the industries that it serves and to enable growth in new markets. Dr. Nalamasu is also the president of Applied Ventures, the venture capital fund of applied materials, overseeing the financial and strategic investments in early and growth stage privately held companies. A world-renowned expert in material science and technology and one of our industry's respected forward thinkers, Dr. Nalamasu has championed a renewed focus on the company's innovation culture through various internal development programs and open innovation methods. He has strengthened applied materials, strategic relationships with universities and research institutes around the world. Now to own for a keynote talk on what Applied is doing to help the U.S. better position itself in this critical area. We'll have five minutes at the end of Ohm's talk for Q&A, so feel free to send in your questions as Ohm goes through his presentation. Over to you, Ohm. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nick. I appreciate the kind uh, introduction. The, the challenge, the problem statement that's given to us uh, today is that uh, the university system in the United States is a hotbed of innovation, which we all agree, but there is a chasm or a gap between innovation to commercialization in the hard tech or the deep tech space. So we are asked to come up with ideas or experiences that we can share on challenges and opportunities to improve the national ecosystem, not just for launching, but more importantly, sustaining hard tech hey, Om, startups. I'm sorry to cut you off, but it looks like we have the wrong screen on share. Can you switch over to the presentation screen? So what I like to do is uh, share some of our experiences in you know, really thinking about innovation to commercialization and uh, you know, some of the ideas and experiences that we have in that space uh, today. My presentation does contain some forward-looking statements and other information. So let me give you a, just a 30-second snapshot of where Applied Materials today is. Last year, our revenue was about $23 billion. We invest over $2.5 billion in research and development. I have 27,000 employees at this point in 19 countries. On average, we file about four patents a day and have about 16,000 issued patents uh, for apply today. And as you probably are watching, semiconductor industry is in a renaissance and uh, it's primarily driven by you know, digitalization of the world that's really accelerating and the big data and AI is driving fundamental transformation of all industries. And has further accelerated this uh, transformation. And also there is a new global recognition. Uh, the leadership in semiconductor industry translates to economic prosperity, uh, industrial leadership, uh, as well as uh, uh, security, national security. So the industry has been driven by waves of innovation, uh, starting with uh, mainframe followed by PC plus internet, and mobility has been a big driver for the industry. We are in the era for artificial intelligence. So last year, the revenue for the industry uh, was about $583 billion, the overall semiconductor industry. And it is projected to go somewhere between 1.2 to 1.3 by 2030. What is really driving this industry is the semiconductor process technology, but you know, we call it materials engineering. Uh, a much broader way to think about the capabilities the industry has developed over the last 50 to 60 years. This is fundamentally about manipulating materials at an atomic level, but on an industrial scale. So what has this given to the world? It has given you the ability to put 20 plus miles of copper in a half inch square computer chip. It allows you to manipulate the electrical properties of the top three layers of a thin film. It allows you to drill a trillion contact holes with precision on a 300 millimeter wafer. And some amazing, <clears throat> amazing capabilities have been developed in the world of inspection and metrology. And the capabilities are equivalent to spotting a single ant from outer space and identifying its species in less than a second. So 
The question we ask is, how do we take the broadest and the deepest of these competencies that we have in the company and the talent and really solve the societal problems, uh, including uh, the challenges in the semiconductor industry? So, you know, broadly speaking, you can atomically remove material uh, in the things like clean, chemical, mechanical polishing, dry or wet chemistries. You can deposit by a variety of technologies, again, with atomic precision, you know, PVD, CVD, ALD, AP, and plating, and so on. You can selectively modify the properties, again, one monolayer at a time, uh, by things like anneals, implant, nitridation, and oxidation. And as I mentioned, some amazing capabilities have been developed in the inspection and metrology. And the question we ask is, what are the fundamental problems in multiple industries? And how can we apply this competencies and technologies in solving problems. So if you look at the top three rows, whether it is data economy, census and communication, connectivity, are intimately tied to the semiconductor industry. So if you're looking at the AI and big data era, this is fundamentally about reducing the computational energy per bit with new materials, architectures, really bridging from materials to systems. And there are several disruptive technologies on the horizon, whether it is quantum computing or DNA storage, et cetera. And the story of communication and sensors is really about enabling the intelligent factories of tomorrow with new sensors for IOTs, uh, actuators, and so on. And uh, if you look at the future of the semiconductor industry, it's quite possible that the next ubiquitous device after the smartphone is AR, VR. And how do you enable that to be the next ubiquitous uh, driver of the industry, next ubiquitous computing and communication platform for everyone in the world uh, is again a challenge the industry is currently working on. We are excited about it. But we also think more broadly, uh, if we have the ability to do materials engineering, that is atomic engineering on an industrial scale, what other societal problems we should be thinking about? So in the context of climate change, Electric vehicles is a big, big inflection. Currently, the cost of batteries is about $140 a kilowatt hour. If you can drive it to $60, EVs reach internal combustion engine parity. And you need to combine that with fast charge. So imagine being able to pump 150 miles into the battery in five minutes. Then you can repurpose the gas station infrastructure to go from something like 2 to 3% penetration for the EVs to 100% penetration as many of the countries are thinking of doing this between 2035 to 2040. And how can you apply materials engineering in solving that problem? And the future of healthcare is about precision medicine and personal medicine. So how can you apply some of your inspection technologies so you can begin to understand how cells communicate with each other? So think of replacing the wafer with tissue and then you can digitally barcode proteins and RNA, so you have the spatial biology. And you can presumably apply atomic layer coating to disrupt the drug formulation paradigms. So these are the things that we think about, these are the things that we have programs, and we are actually pursuing these opportunities by applying materials engineering in a very different way. So the CTO organization in applied materials believes in this idea of open innovation playbook. And uh, our motto is to think big, test small, fail fast, learn quick. And what it entails essentially is to be able to identify the inflections, determine the high value problems, develop building blocks, and you know, incubate and retire technology and market risks. And the most important thing we really think about is how do you bridge the chasm between innovation to commercialization using this open innovation framework. What that really means is that you work extensively with the world at large, whether it is research institutes or academia. Uh, I'll talk about Applied Ventures, which is the venture arm of Applied Materials. Work with customers, work with partners, work with an advisory board. Uh, we call it GTAB, Growth Technical Advisory Board. I'll say a little bit about uh, each one of them. So our focus is really bridging this chasm, going from making a couple of devices to 
uh, making billions of them, hundreds of millions of them, manufacturing at scale. So think about how can we work with the startups? How can we work with uh, faculty uh, coming up with fund funding and working with them on manufacturing technology, uh, helping them with channels and you know, really working together, collaborating. So the focus is to bridge the chasm from prototyping to manufacturing at scale. So you go from an idea to building a business and the idea is to go from innovation to commercialization. So Applied as a company has made large investments. As I mentioned, 2021, we made uh, two and a half billion dollars in R&D. We have uh, one of the uh, most advanced state-of-the-art class one end-to-end -end semiconductor R&D labs. We call it, call it Made on Technology Center. It's based in uh, Santa Clara. We have a display lab, uh, state-of-the-art in Tainan, uh, Taiwan. Uh, we have uh, a state-of-the-art advanced packaging center <clears throat> in Singapore. And uh, Applied Ventures uh, has invested about $350 million in 90 deep tech companies across the globe in 17 countries in the last uh, uh, 20 years or so. And we also have a Meta Center right on SUNY campus, which stands for Materials Engineering Technology Accelerator. This is a state-of-the-art R&D and prototype uh, capability, again, to bridge the lab to fab gap. <clears throat> We have a, a technical advisory board. Uh, we are fortunate to have uh, some of the global thought leaders in helping us uh, think through about this inflections and disruptions so we can build growth platforms for applied materials and solve some important problems for our customers and presumably help uh, uh, build a sustainable uh, world uh, with uh, our contributions, our modest contributions. So Applied Ventures, uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, invested in 90 hard tech companies, uh, somewhere around 350 million plus in 17 countries. And uh, we invest in these companies to be able to learn about the new ecosystems, uh, provide uh, smart money technologies and uh, build syndicates with uh, other investors. Uh, we also uh, invest in suppliers, especially when we are looking at new markets where you may not have a, a, a vibrant supply chain, and uh, some of these companies we do uh, end up acquiring. And when you're looking at new markets, when you're looking at uh, new businesses addressing new inflections, you need to be open to uh, coming up with new business models because in the end, it is about enabling the customers. And within that context, you need to be open to exercise new business models. So that is part and parcel of our thinking when we are thinking about this uh, innovation to commercialization gap. So one of the things I like to point out is that the ventures plays uh, a very significant role as we think about these inflections. And in fact, for every inflection that we are addressing in all these industry horizontals, uh, you have uh, startup investments that Applied Ventures actually has made over the time. So if you're looking at the artificial intelligence and semiconductors, we have invested in a variety of companies. I'll talk about one or two of them. Uh, again, we have invested in, uh, in materials. Uh, uh, Sean was talking about uh, 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 one of the companies that we actually have uh, co-invested in the material space. Uh, in the case of sensors and communications, uh, we have invested in echo imaging, which is uh, working on miniaturizing uh, the ultrasound devices. Industry 4.0, we recently made uh, Makina Rocks uh, investment in the case of ARVR, we have invested in Metalens. Uh, our company, Rockley Photonics, just went public. In the case of climate change, uh, we have invested in Zen Labs, which is working on silicon anode. And uh, one of our portfolio companies just went public, Solid Energy, which works on uh, batteries for vertical takeoff and landing <clears throat> and drones. Uh, historically made uh, many, many invest in investments in solar startups and uh, LED startup like uh, Plane I tried. And again, more recently, we also made investments in life sciences uh, as well. The other thing we have done is to partner with uh, the uh, uh, organizations that are part of different governments uh, where we uh, where we work and where we uh, have uh, customers like Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, and, and Europe. So in Korea, we have partnered with 
<clears throat> Kavik, Korean Venture Investment Corporation, uh, created a fund and we are actually working on a fund too. In Taiwan, we have invested with uh, ITIC, uh, which uh, is basically the investor in, uh, uh, in TSMC and uh, UMC. Uh, and uh, in Europe, we have invested in IMEC fund and we also have a co-investment agreement with uh, Empire State uh, Development Agency. So again, think out of the box and invest uh, where applied materials has, uh, has presence and where there are good ideas uh, across the globe in uh, hard tech uh, startups. So a couple of examples on how we work with uh, startups, uh, for example. Sorry, just to jump in, I don't want to cut you off, but we do have a few questions and we have about four yeah, minutes. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. So this is an example we worked with uh, Adesto all the way from uh, investment in Series A, provided technology that went public in 2015 and was acquired by Dialog for half a billion dollars. Currently, we are actually working with a company that has presence in Meta, a company called Antios in, in MRAM. Again, we made uh, an investment in 2018 and, uh, and a seed investment in uh, 2020. Work with universities across the globe, and this is just uh, wrap it up basically. Uh, as part of the Meta Accelerator in SUNY, uh, we also have a collaborative vehicle so we can collaborate with the entire State University of New York system, and this is called SAMRI, and we are currently going through second fund funding of the cohort of programs, and we have an advisory panel that uh, looks into it. So if I can give uh, just uh, the summary, basically, this is about bridging innovation to commercialization and looking at all the components that are necessary and integrating the, the different outputs from those, uh, those investments and really drive acceleration from innovation to commercialization. So thank you. Thanks, Om. It's awesome to see everything that Applied's doing in this tech translation startup space. Um, we had a few questions coming that I wanna to get to quickly. The first, which is really related to your last couple of slides, Om, is um, how can individual researchers at universities partner with Applied? So, you know, we have been part of uh, some, some of the uh, uh, startup uh, discussions at uh, SUNY Albany, and, you know, certainly Anand is going to say more when he talks about uh, Applied Ventures in the panel discussion, but you can get on Applied Ventures and uh, you can easily reach us through a variety of means, uh, by email or phone number. All of our information is out there uh, in the public. And then um, what, where do you see the current valley of death for the semiconductor startups that come across your desk? In your, in your uh, opinion, where's the gap in the funding spectrum currently? Well, I think, I think the gap is not in the seed rounding, uh, seed round or A round, but you know, really being able to work with investors who are there with you for the long haul. So who can work with you in providing technology and work with you in taking you through different rounds so you have uh, ability to go from you know making a few devices in the lab to you know scaled up so you can actually go public as i was talking about multiple companies that we have worked uh, worked with in the past you know Ardesto is a great example solid energy which went public is is a good example rockle rockley photonics is another example so it's really uh, a committed investor who can work with you through the entire uh, entire journey. And, and last question, Om, um, are there any key features, and you spoke to this a little bit in the, in the slide deck, but are there any, as a parting thought, are there any key features, what's the primary key feature of an innovative idea that suggests it will have a powerful impact, at least in terms of applied perspective? Well, I think you need to be solving a high value problem as we call it. And secondly, you need to have a team uh, that is passionate and, and dedicated. And as a team, you should be willing to pivot as you understand the market, as you understand the technology, as the solution itself evolves to solve customers' problems. So it's a combination of all those things, but there is no substitute for passion and dedication and uh, willing to listen to customers solving a problem that matters. Great advice. Thanks, Om. Appreciate your time here today. Um, and now on for our next speaker, a lightning talk 
from Eileen Tungle, is a managing director at Incutel, a strategic investor that identifies and invests in innovative technology startups that support missions of the US intelligence and defense communities. Since joining IQT in 2018, Eileen has led investments in computers, communications, and sensing technologies. Prior to joining IQT, Eileen was at Arm Holdings, where she served as vice president with the new Ve business ventures group and was responsible for the discovery and cultivation of investment opportunities and acquisitions and new growth areas. Over to Eileen. Thanks, Thanks so much, Nicholas. Um, so actually I, I joined Inqtel in 2017. So I've been here five years. Today is my anniversary of joining Inqtel, which, is, which has been amazing. Uh, so just Happy to talk a little bit, thank you. So just to talk a little bit about Inqtel, uh, we have a distinct model we're often billed as a VC firm, but we're actually more than that. Um, we operate at the intersection of three very different communities. We've been successful in our role because we have a keen understanding of those three different worlds. Our government partners, as you can imagine, have particular needs, a particular language, and aren't really natural sharers of information. Um, startups, of course, have their own unique being. It's, they have a different mindset, you have different pressures, you're focused on getting your product to market and not burning through all your cash. And then finally, the, the, you know, the VCs, um, they're all about generating returns. They want to make money. Our value as Inqtel is that we're trusted by all three groups. We have staff from all, all three groups and we have the knowledge, language and understanding to really bring all of them together. Now, Inqtel is mostly known, I believe, for the investments we make. So we are a, a very prolific uh, investor. Um, you'll see later, we do have something like 600 portfolio companies. We make something like 60 investments a year. But what people don't know is that we have grown over the years. Uh, we recognized that um, a lot of our customers, and when I say customers, I mean the defense and intelligence uh, community had a set of problems that there really was no technology that was mature enough to solve. So we wanted a place to experiment with other technology uh, partners to, and that's why we created IQT Labs. At IQT Labs, we really work with the art of the possible to understand where these technologies and products from these partners can go and where it does and doesn't work. At the same time, if you see on the, the kind of end of the slide, we created B Next. B Next represents our biofocused initiative focused on threats of infectious disease. Yes, this was before um, COVID. They've vetted and invested in startup technologies from point of care diagnostics, vaccine development, and more. Many of those were, of course, useful in developing some of the vaccines um, that have brought, fortunately, almost brought this uh, pandemic to the end. And they really have been, IQT Labs and B Next have really been a, a big value proposition for our, our customers. Recently, we created IQT Emerge, which uh, many on this phone, uh, the, the, they're based uh, mostly in Boston. So those of you there may, may be interested in knowing about it if you don't. And IQT Emerge supports the validation and incubation phases of innovation, US government agencies and fund. So of innovation. So we know the US government funds massive amounts of R&D, but a lot of that is underdeveloped. So IQT Emerge is really there to help bring some of those companies to commercialization, really help them potentially raise their first seed rounds of capital. And then uh, about um, four years ago in 2018, and this is where I'm come calling from now. We, we started Inqtel International, um, opened a London and Sydney office. I am now based in the London office. Um, we, you know, with all of this, we really feel that we can be your partner if you're a startup into understanding our national security partners' um, needs and demands. Now, if we just go to the next slide. So as I mentioned before, uh, we really have um, expanded out to not just help the US governments, but also with the opening of the London and Sydney offices, we are working with the UK and Australian defense and intelligence communities. We know the US doesn't hold a patent on innovation. That's why it's important for us to have worked internationally. 
As I mentioned before, we have around 600 investments. We do you know, close to 60 investments a year. I think we are maybe tied or second to Sean and, and Intel Capital in terms of the number of investments we make, not the amount, but the number. Our investments span the globe. Uh, this way we can really ensure companies where they live, uh, that we meet companies where they live and work. So if you just look here, um, Actually, it's not here. So we have companies all over Canada, Ireland, UK, Australia, France, Israel, Germany, Finland, Sweden, Norway, and New Zealand. Um, what you'll find is I spent most of my time at Inkutel going in our field technologies practice, which includes Industry 4.0, autonomous systems, intelligent connectivity. Many of those are not announced, but as I mentioned, we are one of the most prolific investors uh, in the space, especially in semiconductor technology. I didn't really give you the background, but um, InQtel was created 20 years ago. It was really this bright idea by the CIA. Uh, it was a public-private partnership um, between the CIA, the president of Lockheed Martin at the time, and um, a venture capitalist that knew that the agency really wasn't getting access to a lot of the innovative technology that was coming out of the startups in Silicon Valley. And today it's grown from us just representing the CIA to all these three letter acronyms that you see here. So InQtel is representing all of these agencies. Um, why that's good is that it really creates economies of scale. Number one, every dollar that InQtel invests in, in attracts another $18 of venture capital. So to be an InQtel company means that you're normally seen as very well vetted and can help bring out other sources of capital. Second, when you work with InQtel, we may partner you up with one of these agencies, but often there'll be interest from a number of other agencies. So that lessens the financial burden on any one agency, and then you as a startup might have multiple customers or partners. And then finally, um, I think that, you know, most people, most startups obviously cannot start their own federal sales or selling into the government. And we really help you as InQtel, we're sort of like your business development or sales force into these agencies. Now I'm just gonna to change topics um, away from InQtel and just let's take a look at venture capital. So I've been, um, I've had, I had the fortune of being a financial VC, uh, a corporate VC, and now a government VC, if you will. Um, and so I've, I've, my career spanned about 20 years. And if you look at 2021, it was kind of like 2000 or maybe the, the 2000, the, the year I, I um, sort of, the, the, sorry, the year before I got in, into VC, it was a banner year. If you look at the total number of uh, startups that uh, received funding in, in the year, and I apologize for how small this is, but uh, really, you see from 20 to 2021, there were something like, you know, 20,000 startups that were funded. That's about 2x the number of startups. The amount that went into it went from 50 billion to 250 billion. So you've got 2x the amount of startups and 5x the amount of capital. If you look over to the, the VC semi industry, um, Similar, similar in terms of you know two x maybe two and a half x amount of of, uh, of capital. Uh, um, sorry, yes, two x the amount of capital, um, and then five x the number of 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 um, of companies. Now, while that looks good, I'm just going to move to my second chart and pull up some of the other stats that I had here. We go to the next chart. Even though semiconductor companies had a banner year, we see that the U.S. semi deals are just 87, whereas in Asia, there were 348 deals. If you look at IT startups, that means that there were about 1.7 U.S. IT startups funded to every one IT startup outside or in Asia. Whereas there are four X as many semiconductor startups funded in Asia than in the US. So I thought this was pretty astounding and maybe the topic that we're gonna discuss at our panel. 
So in preparing for this talk, I really tried to think with my colleagues about, you know, what, what is going on here? Why is it that it's so un, imbalanced, unbalanced when it comes to semiconductor startups? You know, I think, right, we've all seen this chart. Effectively, most, you know, the, the startups have to do R&D, then they do a product launch, then commercialization, and finally success as a business. But hard tech startups and semiconductor startups really have this very, very wide valley of death. And they have a lot of challenges when it comes to finding the right people, getting money, and getting partnerships. These are all the things that were mentioned earlier in terms of having a very strong ecosystem. So I'm just gonna go through each of these and then maybe offer some solutions. So people, the challenge is today, you know, the general population is aging. I would even argue the semiconductor industry population is aging even faster. The average age within our industry is higher and higher every year. The talent pipeline to try to get people into the industry is very shallow. And with that shallowness comes a real lack of diversity amongst the participants in the industry. And if you want our industry to grow, we need to let everybody in. We need to attract everybody in. We need to have a growth mindset. We cannot just say only if you have a double ECS and you went to a certain school, even though all the schools that were mentioned before are great, you can be uh, um, in our industry. We need to let everybody be part of it so that it can grow. And so we can have just as many startups in Asia um, as in the US. Arlene, the next one challenge, minute, one minute. yeah, yeah one almost minute. done. Uh, so the next challenge is investments. Okay, startup investing is hard. The, we know that the venture capitalists from a from point of view, you know, InQtel has invested in a lot of companies. We have made a lot more money on our enterprise startups than we had um, on, on many of our hardware ones with the exception of the space ones recently. And then finally, CFIUS regulations have made it very difficult for startups to get capital that was there before. And then the third one, of course, is partnerships. Many of these startups today in our portfolio have very few supply chain, you know, have very, a lot of supply chain issues. Many of them cannot find uh, multi-wafer, you know, MPWs to run their wafers. And even when it comes back, the wafer comes back and it's working, you have your parametric yield working, it's very, very hard to find that first customer. So I know I've painted a lot of the challenges. Here are some of the ideas to get started that I know we're going to go to the panel and talk about. Um, but I just, I offer them here, you know, on the people side, really, I think some of the suggestions we could do is more visa programs, increase diversity, use community colleges to get people in um, for investment, SBIRs, the government doing venture support, much like they do in the UK with the breakthrough funds and British patient capital, if you're unaware, it's worth looking at. Having a trusted capital network to effectively invest in these companies alongside with the government. On the partnerships, assuring supply chain and manufacturing capacity. Um, I didn't talk too much about the work programs that IQT has, but IQT work programs, not just with intelligence community, but with all of government. And then of course, getting those first commercialization partners by helping um, these companies, by incentivizing others to buy from these domestic US startups. And that's it. Awesome. Thanks, Eileen. Lots of really good stuff for us to lead into the panel. But before that, I'd love to introduce um, two more speakers that are going to be joining us for the panel. First off, Anand Khan Nanavar is the Global Head of Applied Materials Venture Capital Fund. In this role, Anand manages Applied's $300 million plus global venture investment portfolio of 90 plus companies across 16 countries. Anand has also led over a dozen venture investments with successful exits, including Adesto and Enphase on NASDAQ and Voltaics, which was acquired by Air Liquide. Anand has over two decades of experience in the technology and the venture capital industry and new business development. He first joined Applied Ventures in 2006 with a focus on identifying and leading investments in the areas of semiconductor, energy, water, and materials. He then went on to head Applied's new business group, which led to Applied's entry into optics, life sciences, materials, and other high growth markets. Anand, great to have you with us. And, great, thanks. And I'd also, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sam Fuller, Dr. Sam Fuller, who is the Chief Technology Officer Emeritus and Distinguished Scientist of Analog Devices. He's been with Analog Devices for 20 years. 
Prior to joining Analog Devices in 1998, Dr. Fuller was Vice President of Research and Chief Scientist at Digital Equipment Corporation, where he built labs researching new processor architectures and software systems. And Sam will provide the operator and startup perspective on today's panel. Sam, great to have you with us. Okay, we're gonna jump right in. Lots of really great discussion here. Um, a reminder to participants to so please um, enter any questions that you have for the speakers in the chat function, and we will jump right in. Um, I guess for anybody, I'll start with, um, with Sam. Um, from an operator point of view, Sam, um, what are the best models of industry, academia, government collaboration to support microelectronics or hard, step, hard, hard tech startups that you've seen out in the market? Uh, Rick, uh, thanks. Thank, thanks for having me join this uh, this workshop on hard technology. What uh, what I actually would like to start off by by saying is, uh, to my mind, the most the most critical the most critical issue here is the role of universities in attracting the uh, the talented, and innovative individuals to work in the hard tech areas, materials, devices, and circuits. Uh, yet, when you look at students entering the universities the vast majority are going into the soft, software and the software technology areas. And unless we can get a better balance, uh, we're gonna to continue to lose to uh, what Eileen pointed out is the, a lot of the work going on in, in Asia. And I think while the universities are working hard at this, I, I believe the venture capitalists as well as established companies have to find ways to, to more effectively get an appropriate balance between the hard technologies and software if, if we're actually gonna succeed at this area. So I know that wasn't a direct answer to your question, Rick, but uh, uh, I hadn't heard it uh, talked about as much uh, in this panel yet. And I think, I think it's really a critical issue for us to be able to succeed in these, in these hard technologies. Great, great point. Um, thanks, thanks, Sam. Can someone speak? So we've talked, you know, we've got um, funds and, and corporations here representing literally billions of dollars on the balance sheet and hundreds of millions of dollars in investments that they're putting to work annually. Can any of the investors on the panel speak to the importance of leading deals and what that signals to co-investors or syndicate uh, partners in the market? Um, Sean, if you want to lead and then I'll let anybody follow. Sure, good question. Um, so at Intel Capital, we do lead deals, right? In fact, uh, I believe in 2020, we led about 70% of the deals um, in which we participated. So um, I do think leading is important. Um, uh, first thing is obviously showing some support for the company, um, providing some brand name uh, value to the company. And um, and usually the best signal that you support a company and you believe it in it is by writing a check to it, right? So, um, you know, putting your money where your mouth is, so to speak. So I think that's important. Um, I think the other thing that um, um, is a benefit is since we are very active in the hard tech space in general, we believe we have a good understanding of what market is for the companies, how deals are structured. Um, and what returns might be. So I think we bring a, um, uh, an experience and wisdom from participating actively in the market to structuring those deals, pricing them. I think the last thing that I think um, in my experience has been very important has um, been um, leveraging uh, our community or ecosystem of co-investors. Uh, I work quite a bit, for example, with uh, a non-applied ventures team, right? So um, we can assess a situation and speak with the company and see, okay, who do you think, decide who might be an appropriate investor at a specific time and um, who can add value, right? Um, and uh, that really speeds up the process, right? Uh, you like to get venture deals done um, relatively uh, quickly. I think I can add uh, also um, over the last uh, couple of years, we've made quite a bit of changes to the fund. So we are uh, leading investments very actively. Uh, we led two thirds of our investments. And one of the main things is just given the understanding of the space and the value chain, we are able, uh, we are able to write the big checks uh, and to move the things along, right? Um, Sometimes we don't have to wait for the consensus to develop because by the time it's too late. Um, we've been working with Eileen and Sean and uh, all other investors on Sandel and globally on some of these investments. It does signal, um, good or bad, it does signal uh, or reflect uh, that somebody that can apply investing in this space uh, signals that somebody has done the homework uh, on that space. 
one of the things we do look for is the ability to scale, right? If you can't scale your technology, we are unlikely to invest. So that's one of the filters we use is, it doesn't matter how good the technology is, if it's not scalable, we're unlikely to um, uh, invest as well. Thanks, Anand. And um, Eileen, given IQT's you know, um, unique position vis-a-vis -vis the government. Can you speak um, bluntly about what the government or other public sec sector partners can do to improve this environment for commercializing hard tech innovations? And I'll let you go any direction you wanna go with that. Uh, so, um, because I'm sorry, I didn't really talk about how the InQtel work programs work. So InQtel work program is effectively based on us curating problems from those 14 agencies. So they will say, I need a capability to, um, so uh, I'll take an example of one that uh, Sean and Sean and Intel Capital and I, we, we need an, a, a, to sense ground movement in a, an area that is uh, low power, ground movement, low power, where there's not a lot of connectivity. How do we do that? And so they'll give us a problem set every year. Um, it's classified we understand it and then we will go back build an architecture and figure out which companies out of the pipeline of companies have technologies that can do that you know make that capability so we effectively will then approach the company and say all right we're going to do directed equity investing in you and we're going to effectively hand you a customer when you're done with this product so this long valley of death to commercialization, we're reducing that, right? So we're, we're not only going to invest, but um, you know, we are incentivized to ensure that these customers pilot and eventually adopt the technologies that are built using our, our dollars. So InQtel is doing that against for the, for the um, intelligence community. There are many other groups, um, you know, AFWorks, DIU, et cetera, that, that are eyeing that um, that same model. Um, I think you know. Again, here I'm I'm based in London. There is something called NCIF, which is the UK's version of of InQtel, but it, it is a it's been a proven model to to get companies to build products that then can be procured by the in you know intelligence community. But also we have many instances where one agency will buy it and then seven agencies will buy it as well. Uh, Nick, this is Sam. If I can just jump in and, and mention, uh, Eileen, I think for the third time mentioned this this uh, this chasm or this valley of death of getting across from ideas to to commercial reality. And uh, what struck me is that uh, uh, what we need are more affordable fabrication facilities so these innovative teams can actually get to the success. And I think you know universities have got some great experimental fabs. Uh, I've worked some at the MIT, they've got a great model there with the uh, nano facility at MIT as do other universities. But what's also clear to me is in the US, there are numerous, I think several hundred, six and eight inch fabrication facilities around the country. Uh, we need to find ways that those facilities can be uh, available to some of our innovative teams uh, to be able to figure out how they move from their experimental realization of their idea to something that's at scale and commercial reality. And so I think, whether it be VCs, it be the government or others, we need to find affordable ways to make those acts, have those fabs be accessible. And I, I think I will also add is many of those fabs are also looking for what is their future? What are the new processes that will carry them into the future rather, in addition to the ones that they're running today? And I think that's a very underutilized uh, uh, resource in the US and we ought to find ways to take advantage of that. Really good point, Sam. And I guess, Anand, can you speak to the value of providing this access to shared facilities, not just, you know, um, not, not just 200 millimeter, but up to 300 millimeter facilities for startups and researchers from Applied's perspective and the importance of that for kind of accelerating more companies out of the gate and those technologies actually landing in the market? I completely echo uh, Sam's point, right? The access to labs and facilities has been a huge challenge. So to some extent, we took the first step around working with the SUNY um, uh, team here, to put the Meta Center. Uh, Vinny was very critical as part of that role, right? The, the second part of it is while dress, a lot of the labs and uh, universities look at six and eight inch as a way to prototype. The reality is the best technologies where the industry is scaling are available on largely uh, 12 inch. At the 300 millimeter equivalents. So, what I would 
look at is it takes a lot of time to optimize on a particular node or, or a wafer size and then transitioning to 12 inches, the other set of um, two or three years endeavor, right? So if we can figure out how we can use the best technologies at a 12 inch, I think that's that's a game changer in terms of uh, uh, technology. So I think there are a lot of government incentives, CHIPS Act, uh, both here in US, Europe and other places that are coming together. I think if we can all standardize around the uh, 300 millimeter or the 12 inch uh, side of the world, that will probably save at least a couple of um, years of iterations um, and also get to market faster at a much cheaper um, uh, cost point. Thanks. Um, so um, question, uh, a, a common question that's coming in from startup. So can you, can anyone, I guess I'll start with Eileen here. Eileen, can you speak to the importance of non-dilutive funding? A lot of the startups that myself, colleagues advise at universities across the country, you know, we really um, emphasize them pursuing non-dilutive funding initially to de-risk the technology and validate markets. Can you speak from IQT's perspective of the importance of that non-dilutive funding and in addition to that, supplemental funding programs that the federal government offers to make it more attractive for private investors to come on after the fact? Yeah, I, I think um, so. Really, if you were to look through the history of, of venture capital, even some of the best exits do not obtain the cash on cash returns that get enjoyed by our, by you know investments in enterprise software or or other you know ml ai a lot of the things that you see all the unicorns that that, that have been coming out um, they just offer a substantial amount of return so for a venture capital to really invest in you and try to get 10x um, the less capital you use from you know, financial VCs the, or any VCs, I guess. The, the, the less capital you use, then the less uh, value, you know, the less people have to pay and therefore they'll ensure a higher return, which will bring more venture capital in. So absolutely the use of non-dilutive funding, funding is, is um, important. I also think I see, you know, in my opinion, sometimes companies raise venture capital when they still should be in the lab. Um, and so it's, it's hard, it's not hard. I, I think there are many instances where you really should just stay in the lab, live off the grant funding, live off research and development funding and not try to raise capital because you're just gonna have to keep raising more and more and more. You're gonna keep the valuations are gonna keep going up and you will not be able to exit to get the IRR that the VCs need. Great, thanks. Uh, question for Sean, this is another uh, startup focus question. Can you uh, give some guidance to startups who are caught in a tough place and when they're trying to get to market as quickly and capital efficiently as possible, but you know some of their primary co-development partners happen to be based in Asia and then given kind of cur current trends and kind of around what we're here today around national competitiveness and security, um, you know, potentially working with other, other countries or regions is not looked upon as favorably. Can you give startups any advice on when it makes sense to work more domestically versus internationally, or if Intel has a preference one way or another on that for early stage companies? Yeah. Um, well, let me just speak to what I've been seeing in the market recently and kind of the startup market. Um, yeah, there've been a number of issues with small companies that um, are trying to leverage a global supply chain or global partnerships, right? And frankly, I'll, I'll highlight the recent pandemic, right? Um, just the um, travel restrictions, uh, the other restrictions uh, caused by the pandemic, moving people around, getting people into fabrication facilities, um, has been very difficult. So um, I do see smaller companies starting to re rethink uh, and reprioritize some of their development um, uh, partnerships um, and some of the locations where they're doing work. And, um, you know, I, I think they are looking at the other investors that they might have and other uh, folks that they can leverage to um, as alternatives. And it's just frankly a, a question of de-risking and, and trying to accelerate because, um, you know, there are these things that uh, like the pandemic in particular that um, really um, made it more difficult, difficult for them to move forward. Um, it seems like there will be more options in the future uh, for companies, um, you know, given some of the, uh, you know, uh, types of activities that are being discussed today. 
Any other thoughts on that from any other of the speakers? One of okay. the things just to uh, add on what Sean said, right? This whole supply chain issues uh, have affected the both big companies and small companies uh, quite a bit, but have disproportionately affected the, the startup community, right? There's not a deep tech startup that the boardroom discussions are all about supply chain, right? We all have been in those uh, discussions. So the question is, how do we rejig the supply chain to make it work? Um, for the innovation and uh, for the timeliness we're all looking for, right? I think that's a problem statement that's worth uh, solving uh, for. I'm hoping that with the different initiatives that are coming together, there's a lot more attention paid uh, to that uh, aspect. If you, if anybody's trying to buy a car today, there's not, there's no cars on the parking lot, right? There's like, you know, and all of them are delayed or there's no access to it because there's a, a ship chip shortage here, right? So I think those are the things that we need to uh, quickly tackle. The second thing uh, I think we did talk about um, and uh, Aline uh, and Sam uh, mentioned about, right? It is, when you walk into a university today, the brightest my, minds uh, at, at campuses or outside are working on optimizing your ads, okay? And <laughs> I know uh, uh, that's important, but I, I do, I think we do need to figure out how we can get more of that uh, incredibly smart talent at uh, 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 MIT, SUNY, Purdue, and other um, schools that are RPI that are represented here, how we can get them to work more on, on a deep tech side. Because without that talent, that the top talent pool coming into um, the ecosystem, I think we're just going to uh, lag behind uh, other countries that are putting a lot more focus uh, around these aspects. So those are the two things I would... Uh, Maybe I encourage us to think. Really, well, this is Sam. If I could make a comment on that as well, because I, I think uh, I'm glad to see people taking up on this. But I notice in pre-college areas, communities have gotten very aggressive in trying to get people interested in STEM and going forward. So we get a good number coming into the universities interested to work in, in these new technologies. But I think quite literally, over 90% of individuals coming into the the engineering, electrical engineering, uh, digital side of the world, they go into the software area. And so we're getting far too little of the most talented, innovative individuals to work in these hard tech areas. And unless we can turn that around, I think uh, uh, we're gonna have a real difficulty competing with uh, Asia and other parts of the world. Yeah, I, I, I just wanna say, I mean, one of the things that's helpful, and I know we're here at MIT is, and, and my husband and I two, own two coder schools in the Bay Area, is Scratch, right? So Scratch makes it very easy for any child to learn how to program and the basics of program, programming. We don't have an equivalent of Scratch for our industry. I mean, there are some, um, there's a portfolio company called Electron Inks where you could start to help, look, kids can learn how to draw circuits but, but there should be a mechanism for people younger than even college age or high school age to get on a computer, design a chip, get it out the next day. Um, that, that's, that's something we need, we need to work on. There, there are these Arduino boards, there are all these other type of boards for makers to try out. And I'm sure those of you with kids, maybe we, we, we do that with them, but the kind of process engineering, design, fabrication, there isn't an equivalent yet. Um, and that's something I think, you know, we need a scratch, a, a scratch type uh, uh, mechanism for semiconductors. Great point, great. Thanks Eileen, great point indeed. We have a ton of uh, questions coming in. A lot of it is really focused on shared facilities and bridge tools. So we'll definitely be diving into that later this afternoon, some of the sessions we have planned. I wanna end this session with a very timely question that's gonna feed into our next panel, which is on intellectual property. And I'll give all, all of our speakers a chance to quickly um, comment on this before we wrap. Compared to other sectors, critical new intellectual property for deep tech or microelectronic startups is often from multiple academic or other sources. Pulling various pieces of IP together into a viable portfolio for a startup seems to be a unique challenge. Have your firms facilitated this process or can you provide any best practices? And I'll let anybody lead off. 
this is a tough question. In a certain sense, every uh, academic institution or uh, labs are unique. Um, there are some like uh, Stanford and MIT, which have a very uh, well oiled machine uh, on the IP part, but others are also trying to catch up. This has, I don't think there is one uh, uh, slot that fits all kind of a mechanics. On the deep tech side, um, IP is something very critical that startups will look at. Um, uh, it is not critical that everything needs to be exclusive. A lot of startups just get hung up on, uh, like, you know, spend a year or two just negotiating with the IP offices. I think that needs to change. Uh, we need to move faster on these things. Um, I think an equivalent of, like, you know, what uh, the Y Combinator did with the safe nodes, we need to have a similar kind of a IP, like a binder, uh, take it, keep it, uh, uh, keep it simple so that we don't have to pay uh, uh, thousands uh, or hundred k plus for IP licensing with the lawyers uh, and move move fast. I think an equivalent of that would be a, uh, probably do a lot of good for the sector. Yeah, in my my experience, um, I, I have haven't had a lot of experiences where a single startup has had to draw um, IP or license um, IP from multiple institutions. So. Uh, oftentimes, uh, it's been from one institution, and then, as Anand has said, um, you know, sometimes we look very quickly to see if there is an agreement in place already with the university. You know, is it fair? Is it simple? Um, uh, how does it impact? Does it impact the business reasonably if the business scales? Right. So it's a fundamental piece of our due diligence, and um, I think some of how those deals will get done in the future will be market driven because companies that have a complicated situation, um, you know, um, it's harder to fund them. Right. So um, so we do look at that, but um, it's oftentimes for me been kind of one to one company to single university. Eileen? Yeah, my, my comment is that maybe we're less focused on any single company's IP because we are always focused on the application that it's going into. And the application that it's going into is servicing some mission. And in reality, those people are on the front line trying to you know, make sure we're all safe while keeping themselves safe. So the solutions are, are often a combination of different products from different companies. And I think that's what, while it's very important to make sure your IP portfolio is very strong and you have it, um, it's also important to not lose sight of your end customer and what they're doing. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's probably my statement. So we don't do that much with respect to kind of helping any one individual company secure lots of IP from different sources for that company, but rather leveraging what they have along with perhaps other company solutions, because you have to be very solutions minded, to deliver something that will provide mission impact. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Eileen. And Sam, any final thoughts quickly? Well, just on, uh, on IP, I think uh, uh, the hard tech people should also take a look at the open source progress that's been made with software. You know, I've noticed the uh, open source uh, RISC-V microprocessor is gaining a lot of acceptance among the startups. And if there were other standard interfaces or other open source pieces of technology that would allow people to potentially move more rapidly in those areas and not get tangled up in so much IP. Great, all awesome concepts. Well, well, thank you for our speakers, Sam, Ohm, Eileen, Anand, Sam, we appreciate your time. Some really quick takeaways from this session. Strategic dollars are key in this space. So these are the types of investors that you wanna be approaching. It's, it's clear that more affordable fabrication facilities and access to those bridge tools is critical across all tool sets and wafer sizes. Universities need to be talent generators and focused on workforce and talent development for semiconductors specifically. Um, and we're going to carry on this discussion around intellectual property this afternoon. So we're going to break now for about 25 minutes for lunch, and we'll start right back up at 1 p.m. Eastern with some opening remarks from um, SUNY Provost Shadi Sandvik, and we'll jump right into that intellectual property panel discussion. Thanks again.